We'll get things started uh, with our EUS keynote presentation by Dr. Ken Binmuller. Dr. Binmuller is the Director of Interventional Endoscopy Services at CPMC in San Francisco, California. He lists three, long, uh, three career long passions, endoscopy, innovation, and teaching, and we know him well for all of these. Uh, endoscopy is clearly the dominant passion and it fuels everything else. He is a universal endoscopist with expertise in all aspects of interventional and his daily practice inspires the innovation um, and uh, to improve outcomes for his patients and enable new procedures and products. He's the inventor of the Axios or aluminum closing metal stent and delivery system that has been discussed and will be discussed throughout this course and holds over 50 other patents for novel endoscopic technologies. He's recognized nationally and internationally as an authority and leader in advanced endoscopic procedures and EUS. And we can't think of a more fitting person to, to uh, give us this keynote lecture on the evolution and future directions of therapeutic EUS. Ken, thank you for being with us. It's really a honor for me to give this, this keynote presentation at uh, the New Frontiers in ERCP and EUS uh, conference. I'm delighted to spend uh, the next 45 minutes with you. Um, I'd also like to take this opportunity to thank Klaus, our president, as well as Raju uh, for organizing this. And also thanks to all of the co-chairs of this session. So I'm going to take you on a quick journey. I've got a lot of slides, so I'm going to go through these fairly quickly. And that really speaks for the amazing, remarkable progress that we've made in the span of four decades uh, of EUS. And it all started as a imaging procedure in 1980, when DiMagno uh, first reported on endoscopic ultrasound. It was the first report in an animal model. And we used the radial scanning echo endoscope. It was uh, purely diagnostic. We had no capability for intervention, but that then changed. Uh, this was a huge leap, uh, a paradigm shift now in the 1990s with the advent of the curved linear array echo endoscope. And we could pass a needle now into our scanning plane. We could visualize that needle lengthwise and we could perform uh, FNA. And now in this millennium, this is where all the excitement is. We can perform therapeutic intervention. So of course, FNA was an extension of diagnosis, but now we can actually offer treatment for our uh, patients. And this is without question, the big new frontier for EUS. And I really think of EUS guided FNA as the birth of notes. It's using a natural orifice to now perform transluminal intervention. We have access to neighboring organs that surround the gastrointestinal tract, the mediastinum, the peritoneum, the retroperitoneum, the pelvis. We have access to lymph nodes. We have access to periintestinal masses and fluid collections. So we really have a large span of uh, organs, almost all of the organs in our body that we can access with this unique window. FNA then evolved to FNI. We're switching out the A for I, and that I can stand for inject or it can stand for uh, implant. So what can we inject? Well, we can inject sclerosis and we can perform celiac block we can perform neurolysis. Most of the work has been targeting the celiac ganglia, but really we can target any nerve structure. Vascular therapy, that is a very exciting emerging area that uh, we are advancing uh, now. Oncologic therapy, we've been doing this for a, a while. Uh, the technology is fascinating. This is certainly very cutting edge. We can perform cholangiopancreatography. I like to call this EACP to distinguish it from ERCP because we're taking an anterograde approach to the A rather than retrograde. And we can perform transluminal anastomosis. So I'm going to spend 
time addressing each of these five categories. 1996, this was the first report of EOS guided celiac plexus neurolysis. This is Moritz Wiersema. He uh, was a pioneer of many, you'll see his name repeatedly now, of these early uh, interventions. So he reported on endosteronomy guided celiac plexus neurolysis, 29 patients. He injected bupivacaine initially followed by absolute uh, alcohol and he used the bilateral injection technique. So he's going alongside the aorta on the right and left sides. And he reported less pain, medication requirement on follow-up, 24% uh, at two weeks and 32% at uh, four weeks. So this was that landmark paper introducing this therapeutic uh, alternative to percutaneous celiac blocks. Next, we saw papers that looked at a comparison of the central technique where we're just targeting the uh, the knee, what we call what I call the knee, where the celiac uh, axis exits from the aorta here, the red arrow versus the bilateral approach. You see that with the blue here alongside of the aorta, and this was from Anand Sahai, a study that looked at the short-term effectiveness comparing these two techniques. Now, this was not a randomized trial, which actually a historical comparison and. That is important to emphasize here. He's comparing a early versus a later practice. And you see the results here. The patients that had bilateral injection had a significantly better response. So his recommendation from this paper was that patients should undergo bilateral uh, injection. But now we see, and this is to emphasize how important it is to perform randomized controlled trials. This is a RCT comparing the central versus the bilateral injection technique. And this is from Indiana. Uh, this is from John DeWitt's group. And here now you see that when you compare the central uh, and the uh, bilateral, there really is not a significant difference between the two groups. There's no difference in pain relief, including onset and duration. And there was no difference in safety or survival. So based on this study now, if you randomize patients in a controlled fashion, there really is no difference between the two. So perhaps we shouldn't subject our patients to that additional injection. Next, we have a randomized controlled trial that compares targeting only the ganglia versus the plexus. So we're comparing CGN with CPN. And this is a study from Japan. It is a 13 center trial. So they're comparing these two approaches in patients with pancreatic cancer pain. So this is for palliation, randomized one-to-one. -one. And the patients in the CGN group, and here you can see the needle targeting only the ganglia and injecting a small amount of sclerosin into the ganglia the ganglia were visualized in 88% of the patients. And this is an intention to treat analysis. That's important. And CGN was found to be superior to CPN, 74% response versus 45%. Uh, and you can see here uh, the results listed. So this study endorses a targeting of only the ganglia versus what we were previously doing which is to just more diffusely inject the sclerosin in the region of the plexus. But then we have this study that uh, was published two years ago by um, Michael Levy at the Mayo Clinic. Now, this is a little different. It's not strictly comparing apples to oranges, but it's a combined celiac ganglia versus uh, plexus neurolysis. And this study found that the a targeting of the ganglia shortened survival without any benefit compared to only uh, CPN, the plexus neurolysis. So 110 patients here, randomized control, double-blinded, 50 patients CGN, 60 CPN, 
pain control at three months, no significant difference between the uh, two groups. In one patient, there's no difference in adverse events, but one patient in the CGN group actually developed paralysis and the survival was significantly worse in the CGN group. And you can see here uh, the graphs. So this of course now raises new questions and at least I think we can conclude we shouldn't take a combined approach of CGN and CPN. So if you're going to do CGN, then only CGN. Now the term block is often used interchangeably with the term neurolysis and these should not be confused. When we perform a block, we're in injecting an anesthetic, bupivacaine, followed by a steroid. Neurolysis is the injection of the sclerosant, ethanol. So the objective for neuro neurolysis is to really kill the ganglia and with block it's to paralyze the ganglia, but it will recover. So this is going to be temporary and we want the neurolysis to be more durable. This is an important study. It's a randomized controlled trial. It was published back in uh, 2012. And they found that the response rate in both groups comparing adding steroids versus not adding the steroid to the bupivacaine was only 15%. But importantly, the steroid added no pain benefits. So you can see the curves here. In fact, here below the patients who received the steroid in addition, they had a worse outcome in terms of pain relief. So there was a shorter response. So in my opinion, we should be performing blocks anymore. And uh, I still do see this being performed uh, globally. Now, here is the big transition to intervention and therapy. So the I now can stand for injection and implant and uh, I want to address next vascular uh, therapy. In 1996, there was a report using the radio scanning echo endoscope. This is Paul Hawkins. And he was actually able to visualize the needle and cross section and inject a sclerosin to treat uh, Dilofois lesions. So this was actually reported as far back as 1996. But it really wasn't until 2000 that uh, Dr. Lee here from uh, Hong Kong, he reported on EOS guided glue injection, and this is using the CL CLA echo endoscope. And the, the concept here was endoscopy on demand, so doing it in the traditional way endoscopy guided versus EOS guided, but really it's about repeating the injection until EOS confirms complete obliteration of the varices. So if you compare the EOS repeat group with the endoscopy on demand group, the outcome was significantly better in those undergoing EOS. Now, uh, I want to emphasize that this is not a strict apples to apples comparison because of course, the endoscopy could have also been with repeat injections until obliteration uh, is confirmed. It's just that you can't directly confirm that obliteration endoscopically. In 2007, Rafael Romero Castro in Seville, he reported on the injection of glue for gastric varices targeting the feeder vessel. So this is the novel target here, the perforating vessel. This is proof of concept, five patients, and he reported great results. Now, why did he target the feeder vessel? The goal was to produce a maximal blood flow blockage by targeting the feeder vessel with the, with the least amount of a glue. Now, why would he want to minimize the amount of glue injected? Well, that's because he and all of us who have been using glue to treat gastric varices, injecting this, of course, in the conventional endoscopy guided approach have seen complications related to systemic embolization of the glue. This is our dreaded complication because the glue can embolize anywhere in the GI tract. And if the patient has an open foramen ovale or AV shunts, it can get into the arterial system and go to the brain. And uh, I personally had one case of a patient 
that uh, became hemiplegic after glue injection. So uh, I, act, I put a moratorium on my use of uh, glue following that. And I started thinking about how we can reduce this risk of systemic embolization. Raphael in 2010 reported on the use of coils uh, for obliteration of gastric varices. So let's just eliminate the glue entirely, just use the coils or the perforator uh, vein with good results, but it required a large number of coils to get obliteration, in one case, 22 coils. There is this study, it is a retrospective non-randomized trial, but they are comparing in this study EOS guided glue injection versus EOS guided coil implantation in both uh, subsets of patients, they are targeting the feeder vessel. So that is similar. And with the glue, a mean of 1.5 milliliters, and they obtained CT scans afterwards, and they found that there were lung emboli present in nearly half of those patients. So that's, uh, that's, that's very uh, impressive in terms of a high uh, embolization rate. When they used a coil, coils, it was a mean of six coils per patient, 18% of those patients still needed glue. Now here's what's noteworthy. None of the patients had evidence of lung embolization on their CT scans, including this 18% that still needed glue. So glue still did not uh, embolize. And this led me to wonder, well, perhaps it's placing that coil first, acting as a scaffold to retain the glue that might reduce, ideally eliminate the risk of systemic embolization. And the coil itself will fill and reduce flow in the varics, and that too can reduce that risk of uh, embolization. And here in this proof of concept ex vivo model, you can see that I have planted a coil followed by glue into this jar of heparinized blood, and you see the glue attached to the woolly fibers of uh, the uh, coil. So at least in this model, it appears that a coil with its woolly fibrous st uh, strands can prevent systemic embolization. So we started doing this in our unit and in 2011, we published our first series of this hybrid approach of coil and glue for gastric varices. 30 patients, great technical success. All EUS guides, as you can see here, you can see a 50 millimeter coil being placed inside of a gastric varus, varix. And that is immediately followed by injection of the glue. The glue attaches to the coil. And here on six month follow-up, you can see the glue adherent attached to the uh, coil. Again, confirming that the coil is fulfilling its role uh, as a scaffold to retain the glue in place. We had re-bleeding in four of these 24 patients, um, and, but of which only one of the patients had a variceal bleed, no complications, no systemic embolization. This is the new frontier that I think we're going to be hearing uh, a great deal about uh, in the coming years and that is EUS guided portal vein angiotherapy. A key advantage of EUS is that we have direct access to the portal vein. This is in contrast to percutaneous where the radiologist does not have direct access. And these are three potential uh, areas for application. The first would be uh, portal pressure gradient um, uh, measurement. I'd say that this is already here. Uh, because the device has now been commercialized so that we can perform this. So I think this will take off um, and will uh, replace uh, the radiolo radiological approach uh, to obtain portal vein wedge uh, pressures. Uh, portal systemic shunts, uh, uh, TIPS uh, in theory, can also be uh, performed. Uh, we'll see if uh, this and it's only be done in animal models, whether this enters into the clinical sphere. But this is an area that I'm particularly excited about. It's called EPIC, portal injection chemotherapy. 
And here you can see in the diagram, by the way, how with our EOS scope positioned in the proximal stomach, we have direct access to the uh, portal vein. So this is a study that was published by Doug Fagel in uh, 2016 on EPIC. Now this is only in the porcine model and we are anxiously awaiting uh, a clinical study uh, in the future. But the goal here is to optimize liver levels of the chemotherapeutic agent while minimizing systemic toxicity. That after all is the holy grail of, of uh, chemotherapy that we can minimize that systemic toxicity. So um, for chemotherapy, they used a delayed uh, release uh, chemotherapeutic agents that are bound to albumin or drug eluding uh, beads. And they then injected this directly into the uh, port portal vein. And they found, you can see here, paclitaxel, doxyrubicin, arenotecan. For all of these, the hepatic levels were significantly increased, whereas the systemic levels were significantly decreased. So uh, a great proof of concept. I think for doxyrubicin, it's very impressive. We know about the cardiac side effects, a 30-fold decrease in the cardiac levels of uh, the uh, chemotherapy. Oncologic therapy. Now, I could show you many, many slides here because there's been a, a lot of very um, fascinating research that's, uh, that's been done. Let me just move this one down here because it's meant to be shown afterwards. But here you can see a spectrum of uh, what has been done. We've performed sclerotherapy using uh, ethanol, uh, injecting that directly into uh, tumors. Uh, chemotherapy, especially paclitaxel has been used. Immunotherapy, there's been a lot of work in this space using activated uh, lymphocytes. Uh, even gene therapy, various vectors for gene therapy, adenovirus, uh, herpes simplex virus, TNF alpha. So just a, a wealth of, uh, of, of research uh, that's been done, uh, mostly in the animal model, but there have also been some clinical uh, trials. Thermal ablation has been another area that has been explored using laser, using cryotherm uh, modalities, using radio frequency uh, ablation. Um, here's the bottom line. I, I think as exciting as all of this is, I consider all of this still experimental. We have no proven survival advantage. And unless we have that proven survival advantage, in addition to just anecdotes of our ability to perform this. So we may have the impression that the, our patients benefit from this, but we really need proof in a randomized controlled trial that there is a survival advantage. And of course, when we're dealing with uh, cancer, there usually we're dealing with something that's often systemic and that's uh, a significant limitation in terms of local treatment. But there's no question we're going to continue to see uh, uh, advances in this area, especially for patients with uh, local uh, uh, disease. Pancreatic cyst ablation is, in my opinion, uh, one area that I believe we're going to very soon see uh, an application for EUS guided treatment. This is the CHARM trial that was performed, a randomized control trial comparing chemotherapy with and without ethanol. So the issue is the ethanol that because it can cause pancreatitis. And if we can eliminate the ethanol, this really uh, makes chemotherapy a more attractive option for treating uh, pancreatic cysts. And in this CHARM trial, ethanol added no benefit over just chemotherapy alone, paclitaxel and gemcitabine. So here you can see the results. So we've seen an evolution here from using ethanol alone then adding chemotherapy to ethanol. And now I think we're going to see the application of just chemotherapy making this approach much safer. But this certainly has not entered the mainstream yet. Let me move on to cholangio uh, pancreatography, uh, uh, what I call EACP. Um, and this was reported by Moritz uh, Wiersema. 
1996. So he performed the first EOS guided cholangiopancreatography. Now, this is something that just seems obvious to us today, but back in his time, uh, in 1996, this was truly revolutionary that we could now anterogradely approach uh, the bile duct, the pancreatic duct, and inject contrast to get a cholangiogram or a pancreatogram. So 11 patients, and uh, they failed in only three patients to obtain cholangiopancreatography. So at this stage, this is still diagnostic. Here you can see the approaches. We're going transgastric, transhepatic from the upper stomach to approach the uh, hepatic ducts. We can approach the distal bile duct, transduodenal. For the pancreatic duct, we can go directly transgastric or we can go transduodenal depending on the part of the duct that we want to uh, approach. Uh, Moritz actually called this EGCP, so an EOS guided cholangiopancreatography, but I like EACP better. So what we're seeing now in 1996, we're seeing a convergence of EOS and ERCP. So here you can see the evolution of uh, ERCP, you see the evolution of EOS, and now uh, they uh, converge at this point with uh, Moritz uh, paper. And next we see from the University of Minnesota, Sean Mallory and Marty Friedman, reporting on the rendezvous technique. So this is where, in addition to injecting contrast, now we pass a guide wire through the uh, a needle. And this guide wire now gives us access for intervention. Um, this, in this rendezvous technique, now the guide wire is passed across the ampulla. And you can see it in these cartoons here, how now we can switch to the duodenoscope and we have access to the bile duct retrogradely or the pancreatic duct retrogradely. So this was a landmark a paper reporting on the rendezvous technique. Now something we were doing, the rendezvous, but we were doing that in partnership with our radiologist who passed the guide wire percutaneously. Now we can do it ourselves. In 2007, uh, Olympus had actually uh, uh, developed this front viewing forward scanning uh, echo endoscope. And I wrote an e editorial titled Optimizing Interventional EUS, the uh, echo endoscope uh, in uh, evolution. Um, this has been slow to disseminate, but uh, it gets, gets us closer to that true hybrid echo endoscope that allows us with one scope to perform diagnosis and therapy both inside and uh, outside. So I wanna show you this uh, video and it's already a bit dated because I did it back at the time, uh, so over a decade ago, but in a 78 year old male with jaundice, uh, post B2 with long afferent limb, a CBD cannulation had failed with the pediatric colonoscope. So now I went down with the four view uh, echo endoscope, and you can see here well, our underwater image, uh, which I like, and you can see the CBD here and the PD. And now under ultrasound guidance, we can directly cannulate the bile duct. So this is tr a true convergence of, of these modalities, and we're, we're doing this with one scope. So you can see the guide wire being passed uh, into uh, the duct. So here, here the pancreatic duct and the uh, uh, pancreatogram. And now the CBD. So we've selectively cannulated each of these uh, uh, ducts. Here's the cholangiogram showing the uh, showing the stone, a big stone in the duct, multiple stones in fact. And then we perform sphincteroplasty. And again, this is through that forward view echo endoscope, all with this instrument. So we're, this is not a duodenoscope. This is not a colonoscope. It's a forward viewing echo endoscope and we're doing it all uh, with one scope. All right, now uh, last is transluminal anastomosis. And of course I've kept the, be the best for, uh, for last. So this too, had, we've seen a, a, a long evolution and it starts all, all the way back in 1992 with cyst enteroscopy, uh, so pseudocyst drainage. 
And now it's, uh, we're uh, in 2015, we're seeing reports of gastrogastrosis. I'm gonna comment on that in just a moment a little more, uh, but this is really the exciting new frontier. Uh, and in 2011, uh, I reported on the use of the lambs and this has greatly facilitated our ability to create transluminal anastomoses more safely. Uh, and more expeditiously. So I was in Hamburg working with Nipsandra in 1992, and uh, we published this as a case report. We had just received a new CLA echo endoscope. We, up to this point, this time, had only been using the radial scanning. So this is from Pentax with small channel, two millimeters, but using a self-fashioned diathermic uh, a needle, this continuous needle, uh, inserted through a five French Teflon catheter. Uh, I was able to visualize the cyst under EOS uh, guidance and pass the wire into the cyst. Now at this point, we switched out for a duodenoscope leaving the wire in place. And then we placed through a duodenoscope, the 10 French plastic stent. But this was the first th true therapeutic application uh, of EUS guidance. And now we are applying the cell ginger technique. It's the over the wire technique. And we're borrowing this as we have borrowed so much from our interventional radiology uh, uh, colleagues. And this is uh, just to acknowledge Sven Seldinger, the Swedish radiologist who described this in the late 1950s, the cell ginger technique of needle puncture followed by placing a guide wire dilating the tract to then enable a therapy such as placement of a stent. So in 2001, uh, Mark Giovannini reported on the first colodoco uh, enterostomy. So he's extending this from pseudocyst drainage now to drainage of the uh, uh, bile duct. Reports this as a new technique, also as a case report. So same application of the cell ginger technique, transduodenal CBD puncture, placing a guide wire. You can see this nicely in some of the pictures. Uh, he then uh, performed over the wire bougie dilation and then exchange uh, for a duodenoscope and then placed in the 10 French plastic stent. But he notes, and he emphasizes this in his paper, the main problem is the risk of leakage of bile into the peritoneum. And a year later in uh, 20 to 2002, pancreatical enterostomy was described. Uh, it was uh, multiple authors here. And uh, this is more of a challenge because when we go through the pancreas in a patient with chronic pancreatitis, the organ is indurated, of course, it's difficult to penetrate. So here they used a cystitome. So they're using cautery to facilitate puncture through the pancreas to gain access to the pancreatic duct. But using this 6.5 French cystitome, they were able to access the duct, place the wire, and once again, Seldinger technique and place a six or seven French plastic stent. And in their discussion, it's noted that special devices are needed such as a diathermic sheath, which provides the only means of entry into the pancreatic duct after passing through fibrotic pancreatic parenchyma. So we're seeing how these technologies are all coming together and enabling us to do things we couldn't do before. Todd Barron then in 2007 reports on the first cholecysto enterostomy working together with Mark Tobazian, the uh, ultrasonographer working uh, in partnership with him. And in this case report, patient with acute cholecystitis after placement of biliary stems, they had tried to drain the gallbladder by ERCP, transpapillary, it was not successful. And then they performed transduodenal gallbladder drainage, again, using the Seldinger uh, technique. Now, when we start draining a structure like the gallbladder, obviously a structure that is not adherent normally to the gastrointestinal wall, this is very different from draining a pseudocyst that usually is adherent. And that makes us more aware that transluminal therapy 
is really an intentional perforation. We are perforating, but we're doing that intentionally. You can see in this ultrasound, this very bright layer sandwiched between the gallbladder, the gallbladder is distended. It is pushed up against the duodenal wall, but these two structures are not adherent. When the gallbladder decompresses, it's going to move away from the duodenal wall. And here in a patient of mine who ended up having to go to surgery because of a massive bile leak from the gallbladder when I attempted this, you can see the plastic stent interposed and in sandwiched in between those two cavities, the gallbladder and the duodenum. So really what we need or needed, because we now have, I think, the tools, but it was the tools, we needed tools to prevent drainage, I'm sorry, leakage. We could drain these, but we couldn't prevent leakage. And there are two tools uh, that uh, I have been basically spent the last decade uh, working on. And, uh, and I think that these are truly making the procedure much safer uh, and easier. And the first is the trans, uh, transluminal sin, what we call LAMS today. So it is covered and self-expanding and seals off the tract. It's lumen opposing. But most importantly for me, it pr uh, provides support for transluminal intervention. I want to extend the reach of the endosonographer so you can see some of the patent drawings here uh, way back in 2005. So these ideas have been germinating over a long time. Uh, and we also need a transluminal stent delivery system that eliminates Seldinger, the over the wire exchange technique, something that was very valuable to us at one time, but we really need to evolve further because our needs are different from the radiologists who can work from a sterile environment. We can't work from a sterile environment. We're creating an intentional perforation. So we can access our target lumen with the stent loaded uh, uh, catheter. So in uh, 2011, uh, I reported in the porcine model, I spent a lot of time uh, placing the lambs uh, in uh, animals uh, to finally come up with the configuration that, uh, that would work, holding two lumens in apposition, essentially the functional equivalent to surgical anastomosis. It seals and it tamponades, and it creates a port for transluminal endoscopy. You can see the endoscope being passed through the lambs into the gallbladder and this porcine model, and we can, we have a cystogram and a cholangiogram. So here you can see the, that we achieve durability uh, of the placement of the lambs. Then working with uh, Takawi Toy in Japan, couldn't do this in the US, so we went to Japan and we were able to create the first lambs anastomoses in patients, uh, patients with pseudocysts, patients who needed gallbladder drainage, great technical success uh, and no complications. Uh, since we're removed without complication after a medium of 35 days. But some patients refused to have their lambs removed because they were so grateful to have relief of their symptoms. And the gastroenterostomy, again, this is a porcine model uh, published in uh, 2012, but uh, this is the introduction of the concept of the electrocautery enhanced cautery system. You can see the hot puncture being performed here into the small bowel. So when you're going into the small bowel, that is the most, or, the most mobile structure, far more mobile than uh, the gallbladder. And uh, here it is critical that you be able to deploy your lambs immediately. So the your technique is not applicable, in my opinion, it would be hazardous to use that when you're trying to perform a gastroenterostomy. So you can see the distal anchor, the proximal flange here, and here we've uh, created the gastroenterostomy. Here, uh, necropsy, you can see the stomach with the uh, distal flange and the uh, proximal, I'm sorry, the proximal flange and the distal flange and the jejunum. So we see that the LAMS applications can uh, falls into three different buckets, if you will, categories. We have the pancreatic biliary, uh, pancreatic is cyst enterostomy, pseudocyst or wands, gallbladder, cholecystoenterostomy, bile duct, cholodocal enterostomy. I suppose we could also add pancreatic duct. Uh, that certainly may also be a, a possibility, and we're starting to see some first reports on that. 
Enteric would be small bowel, uh, the gastroenterostomy, but also uh, the bypass stomach, creating a gastro a gastrostomy. And ironically, we're now seeing luminal applications of the lands, none of you was guided, of course, for bridging pyloric stenosis and short uh, strictures, uh, mostly anastomotic. Um, this editorial uh, dates back to 20, 2006, and the title is, Does the Advent of Endoscopic Ultrasound Sound the Death Nail for ERCP? Um, and actually, I think uh, the author is correct that uh, it is sounding that death knell, that EOS guided will over time replace ERCP. We're starting to see papers like this uh, in 2019 from uh, Bertrand Napoleon's group, endoscopic ultrasound guided billy drainage, a change in paradigm. We're no longer approaching this with ERCP and this paper also EOS guided billy drainage versus ERCP for first line palliation of malignant disability obstruction. So we're seeing that we are moving in the direction of EUS guided for as first line therapy. But of course, uh, this is just a prediction. Uh, we'll have to see what studies show. But there's one subgroup of patients who will always benefit from ERCP. And that uh, is the, those are the patients who are post gastric bypass. This is the EDGE procedure. And I love this procedure. We perform this routinely, it's disseminated. And uh, of course, you know, with a large population of patients or post gastric bypass, this is a literal godsend that we can gain direct access to the uh, bypassed uh, stomach, to the remnant stomach here. And we can take the shortcut and uh, then pass our duodenoscope directly to the ampulla to perform ERCP. And we don't have to use our double balloon scope to try to gain access. And usually the cannulation is unsuccessful anyway after all that work. So these, uh, this is the first report by Michelle Kahela, five patients post gastric bypass placing a 15 millimeter uh, lance for gastrogastrostomy or jejunal gastrostomy. Um, and I think this also deserves underscoring because it's a great example of how when we endoscopists are given tools we come up with ways to use those tools for the benefit of our patients. And so this is a wonderful illustration of that. This is my uh, last slide. And this is what it's all about, expanding our reach. We wanna expand the reach of therapeutic EUS. Who would have thought that the day would come when we would go beyond the gastrointestinal tract? We were literally caged in, in the GI tract. We could do wonderful things, but, but now our reach has extended outside. We can pass our endoscope directly into structures neighboring the GI tract. And the GI tract really runs the length of our body and gives us access to virtual, virtually every major organ in the body. So we're going to see the continued development of dedicated US devices neurological to denervate and stimulate in oncology. We'll be seeing a movement towards precision ablation. So this is the advantage of EUS. The, the higher resolution, our ability to more precisely intervene and to customize that interve their intervention for our patients. And I think immunotherapy, just as we're seeing in oncology in general, we're gonna see applications under US guidance. Vascular, the spurgeoning area, we're going to see, I think, thrombolysis. So I've seen reports of portal vein thrombolysis, patients who have portal vein thrombosis, because um, we can access the portal vein again directly under US guidance. Drug delivery, we talked a little bit about that. Uh, and I look forward to studies like EPIC uh, going into uh, patients now. And shunts, we can perform these uh, shunts. I'm just not sure I wanna be called at three in the morning to do a tip spell. Anastomosis, well, basically, if you can see it, you can drain it or you can anastomose it. So a real exciting future ahead. Thank you very much again for this great privilege of presenting the keynote lecture. Ken, thank you. That was really a fascinating, amazing lecture. And I think it 
was, um, you know, a beautiful demonstration of your dedication to this field um, and how much we have to learn. Also, sort of a real reminder that we, you know, need to get back to basics in order to understand how we can progress forward. Um, I do have a question for you, actually related to this last slide and your process and in innovation. Um, how important is it to now kind of work in more of a multidisciplinary fashion with um, oncologists, with our surgeons, um, in order to understand the implications of these therapies that we are, you know, um, not only the, the implications actually to start with the needs, the unmet needs, and then the implications of what we'll now be able to enter, because we're going far beyond just GI. Wow, that, Amrita, that is just a, a wonderful question. Uh, it's so important that we really start, we've been talking about this for a long time. There are so many pioneers of the idea, starting with Peter Cotton, with the idea of a digestive disease center, bringing radiologists and surgeons and endoscopists together and working as a, a team. So, uh, and then obviously Dick Kozarek at Virginia Mason, also a, a, an advocate for, for this approach that makes obvious sense. Um, and, and Cheyenne, of course, uh, you are benefiting from that model that Dick created. We have to see this dis uh, really disseminate more. And we sh really, I almost feel it should be a prerequisite. And we have a interdisciplinary uh, tumor board now every week. And uh, we have everyone sitting at the table to discuss these cases. The days are over where you uh, propose a treatment in isolation. So when we develop these device, devices, firstly, we should benefit from the opportunity to adapt technology from other specialties. And remember, surgery is also evolving. It's becoming less and less invasive. So we have so much that we can learn from our surgical and our radiology colleagues. Um, and that's one thing I learned with Nipsahendra. I remember you, the Chiruma wire, that didn't start with us, you know, the glide wire. He borrowed that from the radiologist. He spent a lot of time working in radiology or observing because he saw the wealth of innovation there. So, so critical really as we think about devices as first of all, we need to identify where the need is. And really there's no need to invent something if another specialty can do it well with great outcomes. Why should we try to reinvent the wheel, so to speak? So let them take care of it. But if there is something we can do less invasively or with a better outcome for our patients, then we should innovate. And we should take advantage of the wealth of experience that already exists in these other specialties. That's great. and and. Um... Maybe also to, to challenge you a little on one of the things you mentioned about EUS taking over um, from ERCP or, or <laughs> getting rid of it. Do you think this yeah. applies to both malignant and benign disease or is there still a role for um, respecting the anatomy in when we don't necessarily need to alter it? Well, we again, this is uh, an area where I think if we have the right tools that allow us to now approach uh, benign disease, we never want to burn bridges. So one of the big open questions about cholecysto enterostomy, so draining the gallbladder internally under EOS guidance, the big question is, well, how would that impact a cholecystectomy? Should the patient need one? So we have to have that question answered. If there's a way that we can do this and it will not impair a possible cholecysto intraos, uh, I'm sorry, a later cholecystectomy, then yes, uh, we can start thinking about using this beyond just situations where the patient's a poor surgical candidate or percutaneous drainage is not a good option. Certainly in, for patients with malignant disease, let's say pancreatic cancer and uh, bile duct obstruction can be done US guided, but we don't want that that anastomosis that we've created to in any way impact, negatively impact a Whipple operation, for example, if the patient needed surgery. So all of that does need to be uh, addressed. Um, so personally, I think we're gonna get there. And, and, but it depends on having the right trials to 
verify that we indeed are able to do this responsibly and we need better tools. Great. And there's a question actually related to the long-term placement of land, particularly in anastomoses and the effect that you're trying to create. We know that surgical anastomosis is different than that created by pressure um, with the lam as the lambs does. What is your typical um, practice and suggestion with regards to longevity of leaving that lambs in place? And what's the next step afterwards? And where do you see the future of that perhaps? Well, you have to ind individual individualize. So it's, uh, this is the era of precision medicine, right? Customized medicine. And that's how medicine always should be approached even without coming into this new era. So uh, what's very interesting is if you look at the paper we, I published with uh, Takao, um, I think uh, three patients just refused to have their lambs removed. They said, look, you know, I, I'm elderly, I'm, I want to have quality of life. It's not about the lifespan anymore. It's about the health span. I want quality of life. I don't want you to remove this stent. So there you make an exception uh, because otherwise we were removing the lambs uh, after a month. So I, there are a subset of patients. I have a, a few patients uh, who have who opted against having cholecystectomy and uh, they could have undergone cholecystectomy. They were in fact candidates, but they, uh, they wanted to have internal drainage of their gallbladder as a treatment for their gallstones. And they have you know, the lambs in place now two, three years later and they're doing wonderfully. And they come back for an annual surveillance and I check it out, it looks great. I probably could remove it. Maybe the fistula will stay open after being in so long, but the patients don't want that. And uh, so I, I don't know what the answer is. I think the, the way you approach this is you have guidelines in terms of what we know is safe. And for example, right now we're following the three week rule for drainage of pseudocysts and walls. And I think that's fine. We follow that rule, but there are gonna be a subset of patients where we may need, the patient may benefit from having it left in place longer, but we're gonna be more vigilant about the potential complications like bleeding. So, customize, individualize. Great. And um, maybe one last um, question and comment from you. There's a, there was actually a comment from one of our attendees um, commenting about having different rotations, such as a rotation in IR and surgery um, to really help with their interventional GI fellowship and knowledge. Um, what are your thoughts about that? And, and particularly in respect to innovation as, you, as your career has been about? Yes, so when I arrived, it was, this is the anecdote. Uh, I don't think many people know this. Uh, when I arrived in Hamburg, I, I, I went to Hamburg because Nip Sahindra, I considered him the grandfather of ERCP. Um, there's so many devices in ERCP named after him. There's a reason for that. He pioneered this field. And ERCP was my love. I was married to ERCP. So I, I went to his center uh, to refine my skills in ERCP. And at that time, uh, I was taking over a position from another doctor, uh, Horst Grimm. And he was leaving and he did endoscopic ultrasound. Now I had no background in ultrasound at all. In fact, I wasn't interested in endoscopic ultrasound at all. Nip Sender told me that if I wanted to do ERCP, I would also need to pick up endoscopic ultrasound to carry on that program in his department. And I was disappointed by that, but I agreed. So he sent me every morning to learn ultrasound in the Department of Medicine. We were in the Department of Surgery to learn that uh, with Frau Dr. Budoff. And she trained me at six in the morning for an hour every day, every morning. She taught me transabdominal ultrasound. And today, as I look back, I, I, I feel that was so important, that learning process, spending time there. So that's just one example. And I also, because we already did so many, we were part of an interdisciplinary department. Again, Nib Sandra is also protagonist for this concept in his department was called inter interdisciplinary endoscopy. I, we, we spent a lot of time with the surgeons and I was in the operating room a, a lot. So um, I think it should be a requirement actually. It's not just an elective, 
I would say, if you want to go down this path of becoming a, what does universal interventional endoscopist mean? Well, it's not just universal in terms of our procedures, it should also be understanding how these basic techniques, coaxial catheter trick techniques now are used in other specialties. Well, Ken, thank you so much. This has just really been a, a wonderful conversation with you. Um, and thank you, you know, for all of your contributions to our field. I, I think everyone on today really um, sees you as a mentor and we continue to look, we look forward to your continued contributions as we go forward. Um, so thank you so much for joining us and for sharing your experience. Thank you very it's much. My pleasure. Enjoy the rest of your Sunday, Saturday. Thank you so much, Cheyenne.